grace, whose grace knows no measure, and whose power has no boundaries that are known unto men. For it is out of his infinite riches in Christ Jesus that the Lord gives and gives again. Happy New Year. Uh, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, in the name of the Lord, we thank you that you have allowed us to be before you. We consider it a wonderful thing. God, we thank you for how you have kept us over the past year and how you brought us uh, all the way. Lord, we thank you that you have given us a heart to receive, ears to hear what well, thus saith the Lord. Lord, we thank you that even when we did not know you in the free pardon of our sins, yet you loved us enough to send your only begotten son to die that we might have life and have it eternally. Now, God, I pray that everyone who will hear this word will receive it. And God, I pray that you will continuously keep in our minds and that the work may be dark and difficult at times, but the promise is still the same. And, oh God, I pray that in the end, you will give us beauty for ashes. We pray this prayer in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. So in just a moment, we'll go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and begin at verse 16. But first, the book of Isaiah, 61, just three verses. And verse 3 will be our celebration text. That will be our key verse. Here now the reading from this word. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. And verse 3 is our focus text this morning. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And then the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. And so my brothers and sisters, these are, some challenging times and, and in these challenging times when we are looking at so many familiar things that have been laid waste, monuments being desecrated, historical places being ruined, lives being broken, hopes being dashed, we are drawn to this particular word that in the end, God himself has promised to give us beauty for ashes, to give us healing for all the hurt. And there are at least three things that we're going to discover from reading this word, but first let me set the stage. Um, in the Gospel of Luke, which references back to our text this morning, the book of Isaiah 61, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus begins his ministry. He, uh, he is announcing his ministry. He's really announcing his mission statement. You know, here at our church and other churches, we have a mission statement, like here at our church. Our mission 
is to be the heartbeat of Aniston by preaching the gospel and teaching and discipling people. Jesus announces what will be his ministry here on earth in the gospel of Luke. And uh, it is clear to us uh, that Jesus is telling us what it is he expects us to do, which of course is to pattern ourselves after him and not be persuaded, and in some cases dissuaded, uh, by the changing circumstances or the calamities of life, but to stay focused on the mission and the ministry. So he makes his way to the synagogue, and, um, and as was his custom, he goes in, and he picks up the book, and uh, he begins to read from the text found in the book of Isaiah. He begins to read, and and he stands up, and after he finishes reading, he closes the book. Now, in those days, uh, the person reading the book would stand, and everyone else would stand. And after he'd read the book, uh, they would sit down, and they would begin discussing what it is that was just read. And so Jesus begins to do something quite differently. He doesn't begin discussing what he read, because they recognize that there was something unique, there was something different about the reading that took place just before them. Uh, they clearly recognized that here was in our presence the Messiah, uh, the Son of the living God, the one who had been proclaimed to us in the Old Testament. But more importantly, what they recognized about this one that they had studied about and had expected to come, more importantly, what they recognized about this one they had longed to meet and to see, is that he did not come empty-handed or empty-hearted, but he came with a set of principles. He came with a guiding light. He came with a mission and a ministry. And uh, he announces what that ministry is. So if you jump back over to Isaiah 61, Jesus begins to announce what is his ministry. First, he opens up verse 1. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And of course, you and I recognize that in the Old Testament, whenever we find this reference that the spirit is upon me, we know that that is a call to action like Samson, for instance. If you remember the story when Samson says the spirit of God was upon me, it compelled some action. In that case, he slew the Philistines. And in this case, when Jesus announces that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, he is announcing that God has put me into action. God has destined me for a particular mission and for a particular ministry. And the same is true about those of us today who profess that the spirit of God has rested upon us. That is a call to action. No man or woman can say that the spirit of God is resting upon them and they sit idly by and remain silent in the face of knowing what must be done. So the Spirit of God dwelling in us guides us, leads us to truth. But the Spirit of God resting upon us causes us to do something about that truth. And so Jesus is announcing what it is he expects of the church here in Anderson and everywhere. He expects us to be called into action but not only that but he also says something else he not only says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me for he hath anointed me and and in those days uh, anointed really meant um, rubbing or smearing oil on somebody and the purpose for smearing oil or rubbing someone with oil was to consecrate them consecration was never meant to be a badge that we wear and brag and say, I have been consecrated. Look at me. Consecration was always meant for service. Now that you've been called into action, know that the work you do has been destined by God for you to do it. And he has set you aside. That's what consecration means. He has set you aside for that work. There is no greater work for the believer than the work of Christ. There may be, from time to time, some competing interests where we may be drawn to do this, do that, or the other. But we are called to remember that there is no greater work than the work of Christ. And if we truly profess 
that we've been anointed and set aside, anointed and consecrated. The question is, what is it that we've been called upon to do? If you will look at the text very carefully, in verse 1, Jesus announces what it is that the Spirit has dwelled upon him to do and set him aside for uniquely that purpose, which is the same for the church today. And know something, brothers and sisters, it does not change because of civil or social unrest. The people of God are to at all times and all places remain true to the call and the call of Christ. The people of God in the face of calamity, disaster, sickness and pestilence, the people of God are called upon to remain steadfast in the work, the will and the way of God. And Jesus reminds us of what it is that we ought to be constantly driven to do. Preach good tidings unto the meek. In the four gospels, by the way, um, these good tidings, the good news that is referenced in Isaiah it's been in the Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the fourth Gospel of John. And as you've heard me share with you before, in each of those four Gospels, the three synoptic Gospels and then the fourth Gospel of John, there is a common theme that we've discussed before. Love, justice, mercy, peace, and compassion. And so in Isaiah, the good tidings that have been referenced is the tidings of love of justice and of mercy and of peace and compassion. What else could be more delivering to people in times like these than to show some love and demonstrate justice, justice and have mercy, work for peace and to be compassionate. But not only that, but he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You look around on television and on the radio and the newspapers, many people are brokenhearted. But that is the mission of Christ. It is the work of Christians to bind up the hearts of those who are brokenhearted by the troubling circumstances. You and I, my brothers and sisters, as the Apostle Paul reminds us, we are epistle known and read of all men. We are the only Bibles that some people will ever see. They've, they've got to see hope in you. Everybody can't throw in the towel. Everybody can't lose heart. Everybody can't walk away. Somebody has to stand in the gap. Somebody has been willing to say God will never and has never left us or forsaken us, somebody has to do it. Hearts are broken and they're looking, not the politicians, that won't get it. They're looking to the people of God to bind up the broken hearts, but also to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prisons to them that are bound. But what I like most is found in verse three. To appoint them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes. First of all, my brothers and sisters, in the Middle East in those days, ashes, people literally, um, when some great tragedy had taken place, um, when they had experienced death or they had experienced some tremendous disappointment, when they were suffering and found themselves in intractable positions, um, when they felt a sense of helplessness and hopelessness, they would literally take ashes and they would rub it across their face and cover it over their head. And it was a sign that they were in not just mourning, but tremendous mourning. Uh, because you and I know that there are sometimes these, these pains and then there are these deep pains. Sometimes we can experience pain from a light disappointment. But then there are these deep pains, these, uh, these never-ending, seemingly contortuous heartaches. They won't go away with just taking a good nice rest. And so they would cover themselves with ashes and they would literally have a crown of ashes. And so what he's referencing here is that he would take away the crown of ashes and replace it with beauty. So we can all think today what represents our crown of ashes today. You know, a crown really symbolizes your status in society. And uh, we spoke a few weeks ago about the five crowns that are promised to us uh, in the New Testament, like the crown of life, 
and the crown, the crown of gladness. And God is reminding us that he will transform every crown of ashes that we now endure and replace it with beauty by three things hinge upon that action. First, God wants us to remember the mission and to fulfill it in us, with us, and through us. The mission to preach the good news. The mission to show mercy. The mission to have compassion. The mission to live, practice, and promote justice. The mission to lift the fallen, to cheer the sad, to mend the broken, to feed the hungry. God will transform every ash that we experience. I haven't been born out of the battle and give us beauty. Not only does God want to fulfill the mission in us, with us, and through us, but God also wants us to stay focused on the mission. It is not our duty to be guided by the cares of life. It is not our challenge to imitate society. It is not our mission to be informed by politics. It is our whole and entire duty to please and to serve God. And if God is going to exchange the ashes for the beauty, we've got to stay focused on the mission. But most importantly, if you look at verse 3 of Isaiah 61, most importantly, there is a promise. Hallelujah. Uh, there is a promise in the text. Uh, you and I would not have much to live for or hope for if all God gave us were commands. But thanks be to God. He so fixed it that everything he has commanded us to do, every work he has called us to, every burden we ought to bear, every tear we ought to share, every load we ought to carry, God has given us a tremendous promise. And if you look at verse 3, plainly and simply, God has promised to exchange the ashes of life for the beauty of eternal joy. My brothers and sisters, there are two things about ashes. There are two things about beauty. One, ashes often comes after something has been destroyed, has been burned down, after something has been laid waste. Not only that, but ashes also come as a reminder of what it used to be ashes come as a result of something having lost its original state. But the beauty comes in the restoration and the beauty comes in the promise and the beauty comes in the peace. I dare you to look around the land right now. People we thought we could rely on, people we thought we could trust are folding their arms behind their backs. They're walking away. You hear everything except Jesus. Everybody's recommending everything except Jesus. Everybody has a solution and it seems like nobody has called upon the name of God. But I don't want the church to be misguided or misinformed. I don't want the church to feel a sense of helplessness or hopelessness. Yes, these are challenging times. Yes, these are difficult times. But we have a father in heaven who has already promised us that at the end of the commissioning, at the end of the ministry, at the end of the work, at the end of life's journey, he will give us beauty for ashes. God understands that we are going through right now and God understands that it is difficult. God has already taken into account that there will be loss. He's already taken into account that there will be weeping. He's already taken into account that there will be tragedy. But in taking it into account, he's already reminded us that the greater the burden, the greater the blessing without 
a cross. There can never be a crown without a death. There can never be a resurrection. And you and I are to face the days with the holy boldness of knowing that God will give us beauty for ashes. He will replace the mourning. He will replace the brokenness. He will replace the sadness. He will replace the division and give us beauty. Something beautiful will come from the ashes. Something beautiful will come from the pain. Laughter will return. Joy will return. Hope will return. And the sun will shine again after Jesus had announced his ministry. The Bible says he closed the book and he sat down. But before he sat down, the closing of the book is another way of saying amen. It is finished. It shall come to pass. Let it be so. My brothers and sisters, we can close the book today on disappointment. We can close the book on the past. We can close the book on pain. For God, God, God has said, one day, someday, sooner or later, I'll give you beautiful ashes. Endure your hardships. Keep the faith. Hold on. Stay true to the mission. Anoint yourself in the name of Jesus. Work in the name of Jesus. Profess in the name of Jesus. Live in the name of Jesus. And when this journey is over, God himself will descend from heaven with a shout and exchange every ash.